morning, everybody, and welcome to the Alarm Systems Contractors Board on December the 7th, 2017. Um, Ms. Bass, will you please call the roll? Steve Harvey? Uh, okay. Keith Harvey? Here. <laughs> Ken Roberts? I uh, hear more or less. <laughs> Vivian Nixon? Here. Scott Kalkoff, Karen Jones. Uh, let the record show that Scott Kalkoff and Karen Jones are not present and that Vivian Hickson is calling in electronically, but you do have a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is to review the agenda for today's meeting, and if so, uh, we will have to have a voice roll call. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, do we have a motion to adopt? Make a motion to adopt. You can second it. Second, yes. <laughs> okay, we have a motion by Mr. Roberts and a second by Mr. Harvey to adopt the agenda for today's meeting as presented. Ms. Uh, Vess, please call the roll for the for the motion. It's Keith Harvey. Yes. Ken Roberts. Yes. Vivian Hickson. Yes. Okay, the motion carries. The next item are the minutes from the October 19th, 2017 board meeting. Do we have a motion to approve those minutes as presented? Madam Chairman, I make a motion that we do not approve the minutes as they have been presented. There were a number of corrections that still need to be made uh, okay. and that they should be brought back to our next meeting after they have been uh, more thoroughly reviewed. Okay. Second. So, all right, we have a motion by Mr. Roberts and a second by Mr. Harvey not to approve the minutes as presented, but to present at the February meeting. Ms. Bess, please uh, do the roll call vote. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ken Roberts? Yes. Vivian Hickson? Yes. The motion carries. Uh, these will be delayed until the February meeting. The next uh, item on the Madam Chair, let, let, me, let me stop you just a moment, please. Okay. Um, I just wanted to read the statement of necessity into the record since we do have um, the quorum by electronic means. <clears throat> this is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Tennessee Alarm Systems Contractors Board, which is taking place in Conference Room 1B of Davy Crockett Tower in Nashville, Tennessee. Notice of this meeting was posted to the board website on November 29, 2017. As there is not a physical quorum present, a statement of necessity will be read into the record and filed with the Tennessee Secretary of State as required by statute. Pursuant to Tennessee Code Annotated 8-44-108-B2, which states, if a physical quorum is not present at the location of a meeting of a governing body, then in order for a quorum of members to participate by electronic or other means of communication, the governing body must make a determination that a necessity exists. That determination must include a recitation of the facts and circumstances on which it was based. Further, Tennessee Code Annotated 8-44-108A3 defines necessity as matters to be considered by the governing body at that meeting require timely action by the body that physical presence by a quorum of the members is not practical within the period of time requiring action, and that participation by a quorum of the members by electronic or other means of communication is necessary. This is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Tennessee Alarm Systems Contractors Board. The purpose of this meeting with members attending by teleconference is to discuss the agenda as posted to the board website. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. We can continue. Do we need a motion to approve that, or do you just read it, reading it is sufficient? Reading it is sufficient. Thank you. Okay. So we don't need a motion. <coughs> just uh, actually reading it into the record is sufficient to approve it by, or, or to approve the meeting handled this way. Correct. Okay. All right. The next item on the agenda is the legal report. Ms. Thomas? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Okay, I'll begin with case number 12170471171. Complainant alleges that respondent is advertising installation of security cameras without a license. This matter was sent for investigation. The investigator determined that respondent was licensed as an alarm system systems contractor on May 8, 2014. 
That license expired on May 31, 2016. Additionally, there was no evidence that respondent ever registered as a corporation with the state of Tennessee. However, a limited liability corporation in the state of Kentucky was located, but this corporation was dissolved on October 1, 2016. The respondent told investigator that he, that he was a qualifying agent for another alarm company which was based in Tennessee. Respondent told the investigator that the respondent company only operates in Kentucky at this time. Respondent also told the investigator that he was in the process of severing his association with the Tennessee company so that he can apply for licensure for the respondent company. Respondent states that he has not conducted any business in Tennessee since the expiration of the company license. My recommendation is to close. Okay. Do we have any discussion on the, on the decision or the I'm, recommendation? I would make a motion that we concur with counsel on this decision. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Harvey. Do we have a second? Second. And a second by Mr. Roberts. Ms. Fest. Uh, Keith Harvey? Yes. Ken Roberts? Yes. Vivian Hickson? Yes. Motion. So the motion carries to concur with our counsel's recommendation. Okay. Case number number two. Yes, case number two is two zero one seven zero five seven two two one. Complainant alleges that respondent continued to bill for services after they were canceled personally with the CEO via telephone in June 2017 and by letter in July 2017. Respondent stated that the contract with complainant required 30 days written notice prior to cancellation. Respondent received written notice of cancellation on July 12, 2017. Respondent responded to the complaint and stated that the contract has been canceled and that there is no balance owed on the account. My recommendation is to close. Madam Chairman, I make a motion that we concur with the recommendation of counsel. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Roberts and a second by Mr. Harvey to concur with our counsel's recommendation. All in favor, uh, Ms. Best, please call the roll. Harvey? Yes. Ken Roberts? Yes. Vivian Hickson? Yes. The motion carries. Okay. Case number three is 2017-057-241. Complainant alleges that respondent came to her home and told her that her current alarm company had merged with the respondent's employer and that he was there to, quote, upgrade the system. Complainant made calls and determined that there was no merger and she immediately put a stop payment order with her bank. Complainant alleges that respondent obtained her business fraudulently. Respondent responded to the complaint and states that they resolved the matter through the Better Business Bureau complaint and that the services were canceled and the agreement was terminated. Respondent provided no statements as it relates to the alleged fraudulent activity in obtaining the complainant's business. My recommendation is to authorize a formal hearing and send a consent order with a civil penalty of $500 for violation of Tennessee Comprehensive Rules and Regulations 0090-06 dash point zero three two F being the standards of conduct and ethics. Madam Chairman, I make a motion we concur with the recommendation of our council. I second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Roberts and a second by Mr. Harvey to concur with our council's recommendation. Ms. Best. Keith Harvey? Yes. Ken Roberts? Yes. Vivian Hickson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Okay. Case number four is 2017-057-981. This is an industry complaint. Complainant alleges that respondent was performing an upgrade to a hospital's fire alarm devices and that respondent is unlicensed. Respondent responded to the complaint and states that there was, they were not installing the system, only furnishing materials for the installation. An investigation was requested. The investigator determined that a licensed company had contracted with two individuals to perform the work. One of the workers is listed as an applicant and one is not listed at all. Respondent states that he never received any paperwork back from the state on the expired applicant. My recommendation is to close.
ask a question here. The, the respondent apparently replied that they had contracted with two individuals to do the work? Yes. Okay. So two, uh, two employees, or they would, would have been independent contractors, I'm assuming, uh, to conduct the work. And their argument is that one of the people they thought had a license and it was expired and the other person had an application on file. And I guess they reached out to the board office uh, to determine the license status of the expired party, but they claimed that they did not get a response back. The licensed company couldn't contract with other individuals or companies because the individuals be acting as, as independent contractors, couldn't do that. And I, and I think in, in this case, the terminology of contracted with, I think they're referring to the employer-employee relationship as the, I guess, the alarm systems contractor and then the person they hired being the independent contractor. So they're paying them as a 1099 versus a W-2. I think in this instance, that's the term contracted with. So not necessarily a joint venture on the on the Saying they were working as employees to the licensed contract. <laughs> right. I don't think you can do that. If if it, you're paying them, it doesn't with, seem to me either that they could. If you pay them as a 1099, then they are ba basically you're saying that they're independent contractors. Okay. They would have to be QAs and have uh, a license in order to do that. Okay. So I guess in in that sense, if, if we're going by that, then I would need to change my recommendation that there was some sort of joint venture happening. Either a joint venture or the two individuals that were supposed to be doing the work were uh, not licensed to do it. Uh, this, I think, needs some more work on this one. The uh, Actually, it, it appears to me that the, what's happened is, and I, I don't know about the uh, original respondent, were they just a, uh, an equipment supplier? They were just supplying the equipment? Or is, or is that the licensed company we're talking about here? That's the licensed company that said that they were furnishing the materials, that's the licensed company. Something, something's not right there. They are, it sounds like what they were doing was they were trying to uh, do the job, they were a licensed company, they were trying to do the job, but weren't going to use their employees to do it and weren't going to hire somebody as part of their company to do it. That, that, that's, something's not right here. Okay, so are you requesting additional investigation? I, I think we need some additional investigation and information on this. Right, and you uh, it, it would appear to me, just from what I'm seeing here, that the licensed company is not doing, they're, they're not above board on this thing. Right, so do you want me to investigate, I guess, their business practices? Because like, like I said, there was an investigation conducted on this particular complaint, so if I could get some guidance as to exactly what I'm looking into. What do you think, Keith? We need to figure out the, the two gentlemen that's working, what, what is their relationship? I think that's what we're really after. If, if they were going to be employed by the licensed contractor, then... I'm giving the names. Can you read, I guess, their portion of that, Stuart, for the, for the board? And, and, something's not right. right and, I'm, and I'm asking Stuart to read from the actual investigation file okay. so that you can see exactly what was said. Uh, the investigator called the respondent and asked about the allegations. Uh, they admitted to paying a Tennessee licensed contractor to make the needed re renovations and upgrades uh, to the establishment. Now, that would be the hospital that is making that reply. That would be the respondent. The named respondent. The so named they're saying that would be gave the equipment to another licensed company. Right. And then the other company that the equipment was given to confirmed that they were currently installing the fire alarm system at the hospital. <coughs>
also told the investigator that two men at his company were working on site doing the installation of the new fire alarm system. Is that person that said they had the two people working on site, is that company licensed in Tennessee as an alarm systems contractor? Yes. For, for fire alarms? Yes. Okay, well, that's, that sounds proper. So the, so the named respondent in this complaint, they indicated that we only furnished the equipment to a licensed company. The licensed company said, yes, we did get the equipment from the named respondent, and we sent two people on site to, to uh, do the installation. Those people had, I think, did they say an expired license? And then the other person had an application on file. Right. They worked for a licensed company. Right. So the licensed company used uh, employees that were either not registered or expired. One, one apparently had an application, right? And but the other one had expired, right? And and part of their response in in that regard is that they contacted the board office about the expired applicant, but did not hear back. And I cannot confirm whether or not that actual communication was true. Uh, our office wasn't able to, when I checked mm -hmm. into this, I wasn't able to follow up on this either. I don't know whether they did or did not contact the office. That, that would sound like uh, an actionable complaint that they are, have, they have em, working employees with an expired application. I agree. Um, but it sounds like the original respondent just furnishing the equipment to a licensed contractor, that doesn't seem to be a violation. Right, and, and that goes to my recommendation. I think that if we are going to investigate the other company, that's a separate complaint. That, that would seem appropriate. Close this case as it is and open a new one. Okay, Keith, I only heard a small portion of what you said. So I would make a motion to, uh, to follow a recommendation of counsel to close this case and to open another case against the secondary company to check on the registration of their employees. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Hardy <coughs> and a second by Mr. Roberts to close the original complaint on the respondent and to open a new case on the licensed company who installed the alarm. Ms. Best? Harvey? Yes. Ken Roberts? Yes. Vivian Hickson? Yes. Motion carries. Case number five is 2017-059-121. Complainant alleges that respondent installed an alarm system at a home that she owns, but that her daughter lives in. Complainant was alerted to this when she received an email that her credit score had changed. Complainant discovered that respondent had written off the account for non-payment and that her name was listed as the customer. Complainant had her daughter locate the original contract and it was not signed by the complainant. Respondent responded to the complaint and states that they are working to resolve the complaint to complainant satisfaction. They state that complainant's name has been removed from all aspects of the delinquent account. There has been no rebuttal from the complainant, and my recommendation is to close. Make a motion to concur with counsel. Close this case. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Harvey and a second by Mr. Roberts to concur with their counsel's recommendation in this case. Ms. Best, please call the roll. Keith Harvey? Yes. Ken Roberts? Yes. Vivian Hickson? Yes. Motion carries. Case number six is 2017-059-721. Complainant alleges that she was on a free trial period with respondent and that she had paid for the system in full with the money back guarantee. When she called to cancel and get her money back, she was told that she signed a three-year contract. Complainant has halted the monitoring and respondent is still charging $27.99 for nothing. Complainant alleges she was never told about the contract. 
complainant blocked her credit card company from paying respondent without her permission. Respondent initially requested an extension for the response until September 27, 2017. Respondent provided a response to the complaint on November 22, 2017. In their response, respondent states that the complainant actually contracted with one of their authorized dealers and that these authorized dealers are authorized to market and sell respondent's monitoring equipment or services, I'm sorry. Respondent states that these authorized dealers are independent contractors and not agents of respondent. Respondent states that the complaint, I'm sorry, the complainant currently has no obligation to them but provided a response from the authorized dealer. The authorized dealer provided a response and is refusing to provide a refund or cancel complainant's contract. My recommendation is to close as to the named respondent. Additionally, I would recommend establishing a complaint against the authorized dealers for violations of Tennessee Comprehensive Rules and Regulations 0090-06 being the standards of conduct. Kind of sticky. We don't we don't really have a good response from the respondent. Question was whether he felt like that this lady was. And and to that point, I would say I think that that is probably because they the named respondent did not contract with the complainant. An authorized dealer did, and so their knowledge of the actual contracting is limited in that an authorized dealer made the contract, and that's why I said establish a complaint against those parties. But, but they, are the one that, they are the ones that are charging her, apparently. Apparently she's still being charged $27.99 for, from the respondent company. Right, and, and respondent company did indicate that, that she has no obligation the complainant has no obligation to them. Having no obligation to them, does that what what does that exactly mean? Um, from my reading of it, that they are not charging her the twenty seven ninety nine, and so they they don't have any additional business with her. Yeah, but then you say the authorized dealer provided a response in refusing to provide a refund or cancel her contract. Right, and, and that, that is a separate party from the named respondent. Yeah, but didn't the original company not send the second company out to um, upgrade her system or whatever it was? Or no. uh, provide a, pre, a free uh, period? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that the named respondent sent out the authorized dealer. I think the authorized dealer is probably marketing the named respondent's equipment and, and monitoring services. So it's not like they sent them out on this particular sales pitch. Um, it's just that when they showed up door to door, they're saying we're offering this equipment, these monitoring services. Sounds like the installing company, not the respondent that we have here, that the installing company went out and installed an alarm system, got a contract, and turned around and sold that contract off to the respondent company that we have here. Right. Um, they started billing the customer. Customer says, well, I don't want this, don't know anything about a contract, and you're charging uh, you're charging me twenty-seven ninety-nine, affecting probably affecting my credit and who knows what else. Um, and the respondent company is saying, "Oh no, uh, you don't have a, we don't have a, you don't have an obligation to us." Um, the um, the and and the don't have any obligation to them. And that's kind of a vague term. I'm not real comfortable with understanding exactly what that is. Um, the authorized dealer, the installing company, if you will, um, is refusing to provide any sort of refund or cancel the, uh, cancel the contract. 
Right, and I and I think that that's indicative of maybe a bigger conversation at some point about that type of relationship and and who owes the customer what as it relates to I'm installing equipment from one company but I'm a dealer you know for this company um, because I think a lot of times the complaints that I see sometimes the customers are confused as to who they're actually contracting with so I think that might be a bigger conversation to have um, and I think that's probably what causes confusion in these complaints I'm, I'm sure it is the the authorized dealer and I maybe I ought to call them the install the in, uh, installer company and I would assume that they're a licensed company um, it will go out and do all provide all of their services in the name of the the respondent company that we have here <clears throat> so the customer probably never realizes that they're not dealing with the the name they're seeing but rather dealing with uh, the uh, unauthorized an authorized dealer um, The customer here has still got, <coughs> apparently, the customer here still has not received a refund <coughs> and still is being held to a contract. The respondent company says, well, we, don't, we can't do that. <coughs> but I, I would guess that the contract is between the customer and the respondent here. So the contract has the named respondent there, so it has the name, but then it says an authorized dealer in, in a smaller print under it. So if I were imagining, I would think that the customer is assuming that it's contracting with the name You have the a name copy of the contract or something the, that you've seen? Okay, house, yes. okay, fine. So so then technically the contract would be between the, the customer and the uh, authorized dealer? Yes. Okay. Is the authorized yes. dealer in this case a licensed contractor? I believe so, but I would have to double check. If you give me just a second, I'll check. Because if they were the one that came out and told her it was a free trial period, that yet somehow led her to, is there a, I don't know, is there a signed contract with two years of service? I, I'd have to look at that contract again. Okay. Is that something you can do now, or do we need to move on and come back to it later? Um, I I have Stuart looking at it now, but um, okay. if if you wanted to move on, uh, that's completely up now, to the board. It it would seem to me that the recommendation here is probably a valid one, that the respondent is a, a large company somewhere else. And, and they, the only thing they did was buy the contract, te technically. So, so closing that with regards to them is probably an appropriate response. But, and, and also, the recommendation would be to establish a complaint about the authorized dealer. Um, and, and to answer the question, it appears that the authorized dealer has an expired contract. I'll expire license, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> do, do we know? Right, and, and I think that goes back to the question of if they, are they an authorized dealer, are they working under the larger company's license so that they don't need this one? And I think that's why I say it's a big conversation. No, I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't mm -hmm. think that the, author, that the authorized dealer, the, and I, I keep you, you referring to them as the installing company, uh, makes it a little bit clearer. The installing company is a, is a separate legal entity uh, operating under some sort of contract agreement with the our respondent here, um, and and I would I would say that well that they would are not operating under uh, the respond any license that the respondent may have. Um, it would be interesting to find out when this system was installed and, and compare that back to when the uh, installing company's license expired because they may have been installing that license or may have been installing that system with an expired license. Um, all right, now let me, let me offer a hypothetical case for, that's related to this. Um, Let's assume for a moment that the company that installed the system, the installing dealer, 
uh, has now gone out of business, then that would leave this customer with a contract that has been purchased by our respondent here with no recourse to, to go back and uh, have anything done about it. Where, where would we go in that situation? I think that would become yeah, a simple matter at that point. But Ken, I don't, is, am I missing something about the contract being sold? I mean, it seems to me the, the installing company, the authorized dealer installing company went out under the name of Company A and sold the system. But then when she called Company A to cancel, they, they say, well, we didn't actually do it. Company B, one of our authorized dealers, did it. We have no, we don't have a problem canceling it, but we can't do it because our contract is actually with Company B. Is that is that kind of accurate, Ashley? It, I don't know. It is the contract. Uh, Ken, I don't tell me where you're getting it that her contract was sold to somebody. I think I, I'm missing that part. I, I think actually that that would be the normal practice, and the authorized dealer would would go out and do the, do the work, do the installation. They turn around and pass that back to the uh, to uh, the respondent company here, and and they get paid uh, they get paid their money right then. And in effect, the respondent company is buying the contract. Now that hasn't been stated here, but that that don't you agree, Keith? That's Absolutely. The, that that would be the normal practice, and I'm I'm confident that's what's happened here. Um, yeah, the recommendation the recommendation that we've got here is is, is a reasonable and valid one. Um, my my concern is that that here we've got a situation where the um, the customer out there is going to be left holding a bag with a twenty seven dollar ninety nine cent charge per month for who knows how long and receiving no services and, and has no recourse back against that. Um, well, she blocked payment with her credit card. I know she, you know, right now she's still liable for it, but I agree with the recommendation to close against the respondent that to open an investigation or open a complaint with investigation against this authorized dealer slash installer as to if they are legally or if they're still licensed and what their practices are. Could she file a complaint with the Secretary of State or the State Consumer's Office about this billing practice since we have no power over it? She can. Uh, that Yeah, we could refer that to Consumer Affairs as well. I, I'd say there's a good chance that, but as far as the installing company is concerned, I bet you there's a good chance that they're have folded their tents and moved off into some other form of business. I, if I, I'd be surprised to find they still exist. Right. Yeah. But I would like to see an invest or open a complaint against them and have uh, an investigation to see if they are still operating or what their status is. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, so we're going. We're, our, her recommendation we're going to agree with as well as uh, authorizing a complaint or establishing a, a complaint against the second company. I, I think I think we should go a little bit further than that. I, I think okay. that we should write a letter to the um, respondent company, uh, perhaps urging them to get this situation resolved just the fact that they're getting an official letter from from our, our board here would would encourage them to come up with some sort of satisfactory response. Um, so I, you know, I, I, closing it, yes, but I, th I I think we should send them, like I say, a letter urging them to uh, make some sort of settlement with this with this customer, and and see where that goes. So. Uh, I, let, I let, let's let's not close this yet. Okay. Um, let's let's we certainly need to establish a complaint against the authorized dealer, whoever that was, and they are possibly operating installing systems without a license. Um, so th so there needs to be a complaint against them. 
uh, also against our standards of conduct. Uh, so there, there would be one, perhaps two complaints against the company that actually did the installation. But I think, well, like I say, I think we need to send a letter to the respondent company urging them to uh, resolve this satisfactorily on behalf of the uh, on behalf of the customer. So I guess I guess we need a motion to do that. I would make a motion that we we send a letter um, asking them to make some sort of satisfactory uh, reconciliation with the customer. Uh, and that we establish a complaint against the authorized dealer here in violation of the, our standards of conduct and also possibly um, uh, installing without license. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Roberts to send a letter to the respondent company requesting that they make some sort of satisfactory resolution with the customer and then open a complaint against the authorized dealer listed in this complaint to determine their uh, status and also for possible violations of our standard of conduct. Is that correct, Ken? Yes. Okay. Ms. Fast. Um, just just before the board votes, if I can ask a question. Um, so we're holding the complaint open. I'll send the letter, and at that point, do you want me to bring it back to the board with their response to the letter? Well, why don't you do that, just so we'll know what's going on? Is is that a, would that be a problem for you? No, I can bring it back. Just just let us know what happened. My guess is that that the. Uh, that the respondent company will make some sort of arrangements to settle this with the with the client as we are encouraging them to do, but but I I'd like to find out what what actually took place here. Okay. So and and then we could close it at that point. Okay. All right. We have the motion. Uh, Keith Harvey. Yes. Ken Roberts. Yes. Vivian Hickson. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, um, case number seven, it's 2017. Oh, before, Ashley, I'm sorry, before we move on to number seven, when you open the complaint against the authorized dealer and we do, and the, we conduct an investigation, will we determine, number one, we know their license are expired, but will the investigators also delve into whether or not there's uh, registered employees or if there's other violations in addition? to a possible standard of conduct, uh, conduct violation as well? Uh, yes, ma'am. I will include all of that information in my investigation request. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess number seven. Okay. Case number seven is 2017-060-071. This is an industry complaint. Complainant alleges that respondent advertised on Facebook to install security cameras without a license. Respondent responded to the complaint and states that he does asphalt sealing and installs self-monitoring Samsung security cameras from Sam's Club that require no monthly fees or monitoring. Respondent states that the complainant is a competitor who is trying to create confusion about his business. Respondent states that he has a business license and he does asphalt sealing and pressure washing. Respondent also states again that he, quote, puts up self-monitoring Samsung security cameras from Samsung. Respondent again states that there are no monthly fees or monitoring included. My recommendation is to issue a letter of warning regarding Tennessee Code Annotated 6232304J, which prohibits the sale, installation, and servicing of television or steel cameras without certification and close. I, I, I think that that would be incorrect. Uh, this guy's installing uh, camera systems. And where he buys the camera systems is immaterial. Whether he buys them from Sam's Club or finds them on the street, he is still installing closed circuit TV systems, which requires a license. The only way that would not require a license is if you were installing it for yourself. Right. Not for others. Right. And, and, and I, don't, I don't dispute that. 
So, are y'all wanting to open a complaint against this person for unlicensed activity? Is well, we, we, what I gather. We've, we've got a complaint open, um, but I think the letter of warning would be inappropriate. What What is the um, proposed uh, settlement for installation of security systems unlicensed. without licensed, unlicensed installations? Unlicensed activity by statute is a $1,000 civil penalty. I would uh, make a motion then that we uh, authorize a formal complaint and uh, uh, offer offer a settlement of a $1,000 uh, penalty for installing alarm systems without a license. Second. Are you going to repeat the motion? Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Roberts to um, authorize a formal conference hearing. and huh? formal and hearing. To, yeah, I'm sorry, formal hearing, and to impose a one thousand dollar civil penalty with an offer of settlement for installing CCTV. Uh, systems without a license as required by law. Keith Harvey? Yes. Ken Roberts? Yes. Vivian Hickson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, case number eight, 2017-060-321. Complainant alleges that respondent contracted with her parents for services since 1995. After the death of his father, his mother had to move to a facility and the phone service was disconnected. Complainant worked with respondent and agreed to meet and have a mobile service installed. Complainant states that the agent failed to appear for the installation appointment and that respondent is currently billing for no, no services. When complainant's mother was diagnosed with dementia, he discovered that respondent had been billing his mother and that she was unaware that there was no service. Complainant states that respondent continued to bill her parents even though they knew they were not providing any services. Respondent turned complainant's mother's account over to a collection agency. Respondent states that they did not initially cancel the account due to receiving no written notice. They state that as a gesture of goodwill, the account was closed at the agency and that the additional agency fees have been paid and all balances have been cleared. My recommendation is to close. Make a motion we concur with the recommendation of counsel. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Roberts and a second by Mr. Harvey to concur with our counsel's recommendation in this matter, Ms. Bass. Keith Harvey? Yes. Ken Roberts? Yes. Vivian Hickson? Yes. Motion carries. In case number nine is 2017-060-641. This is an industry complaint. Complainant alleges that he received an email from respondent asking if they ever sub out any of their work. Okay, sub, out. sub out, yes. Complainant states that respondent is unlicensed. Respondent states that he only performs, quote, this type of work, end quote, if he is working with a, license, a state licensed contractor. This matter was sent for investigation. Respondent provided the investigator with a sworn statement indicating that he only subcontracts with licensed companies. Respondent indicated that he has contacted the board staff twice and each time he was told that a license was not needed for him to subcontract. Respondent also provided a copy of his subcontracting agreement with the licensed company. It appears that respondent may be confused as to the requirements of the Alarm Systems Contractors Board and the Board for Licensing Contractors. And it can be assumed that respondent spoke with members of the Contractors Board office. My recommendation is to issue a letter of warning regarding Tennessee Code annotated 6232-304-F and close. That particular statute deals with uh, subcontracting with a licensed uh, alarm systems contractor. Make a motion to concur with counsel. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Harvey and a second by Mr. Roberts to concur with our counsel's recommendation in this matter, Ms. Best. 
Keith Harvey? Yes. Ken Roberts? Yes. Vivian Hickson? Yes. Motion carries. Let, let me say this. I, I think that rather than just a standard letter of warning, it, it needs to be explained to this respondent uh, that he cannot, that the fact that he's subcontracting from a licensed contractor has no bearing, that if he is doing installations, he has to be licensed. And um, he obviously, or I'm assuming, that he does not understand that. And and so I would, the, the letter that you're sending needs to make that clear uh, so that he, he won't continue that action any longer. Absolutely, and that's why I say um, in looking at his response in the investigation, I think that he spoke with the contractor's board, which has a bit of different requirements as far as subcontracting. And so, like you said, the letter will include the difference in, in this board's requirements for subcontracting. Uh, I, I, I apologize. I forgot to introduce on record our new uh, Assistant General Counsel, oh. Stuart Huffman. He is now your uh, litigator for the Alarm Systems Contractors Board. We'd like to welcome him, welcome him aboard. And Madam Chair, can we take like a five-minute break? Yes. Are you just going to put me on hold? No, we don't want you to do. We don't, I'm afraid. Don't go through that. No, no, just stay there, Vivian. <laughs> just, just sit there and be comfortable. <laughs> yeah, we'll be right back. Or as just comfortable as possible. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. <laughs> We're going to call our meeting back to order. Uh, the next item on the agenda is appearances. Do we have any appearances today? Uh, yes, ma'am, we do. Okay. Uh, do you want to proceed? Yes. Oh, you should have uh, Exhibit A. should be John Murray on your uh, iPads. Uh, Mr. Murray... Uh, is here with his qualifying agent. Would you come in and come up and sign in, please? Yeah. Would please take a seat over there to the right. Um, I'll give you a little history while they're signing in. This is Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray has come before the board before. Uh, he was here, I believe, February of 17. Uh, we did, uh, you did approve his application based on the fact that he would take drug test and pass the drug test. Well, we were notified, notified by his company at that time, which was Act Security, that he had been terminated, he had failed his drug test. Uh, his, uh, according to the order, he was revoked. Well, he says since new, now, I think as the February the 5th, made new application, and he's with the new company, Beacon Technology. Since his application was revoked, I told him he would need to come before the board and talk to you about making this new application, see if you would approve it. The rest of it I'm going to leave to Mr. Murray to explain the circumstances. Like I said, he made the application online, I got, I think, February the 4th. No, December the 4th, excuse me, December the 4th. He just made it. <clears throat> yeah, basically, I, um, I made a bad decision in using someone else's urine sample to pass the test when I was requested to take the test from ACT security. Um, I, I didn't know if I was going to have a clean sample or not, so that's why I chose to do that because of uh, past experiences. So I was just looking for another opportunity to 
continue doing alarm systems, which I've done my pretty much my whole career. Could you introduce yourself, sir? My name is Adam Cunningham. I'm with Beacon Technologies. I am our fire QA. Leave this up to the board. Let them ask whatever questions they need to ask. Obvious question would be, why was it in question that you may not pass? Well, <clears throat> from marijuana use in the past, I wasn't sure if it would be out of my system or not. And instead of taking it a step further and thinking it through and possibly testing myself prior to going and seeing if I was clean or not, I, I chose to use my helper's uh, urine sample at the time, which ended up failing the test, which is a bad choice on my part. But I have been drug tested since then several times, and I have not tested positive for anything. Did you bring one of those ex tests with you? I have six copies. All right. Go ahead. Uh, Vivian, you're not going to be able to see this one. Uh, it's uh, the drug <coughs> test that he had. Okay. Uh, I'll read this out to you. It's from specimen from screen, S-C-R-E-E -E screen, specimen result certificate for uh, John Murray. The date was uh, December the 4th, 2017, and he came back negative. I would also like to say that <clears throat> getting the results of the positive test, um, ACT, once I told them um, the situation and what I've done, they took me for another drug screen the day that I was terminated, and I tested negative that day as well. But they said that the results were already submitted to the alarm board and that they had to terminate me due to the revoke license and well, can I ask you how, how does eScreen do that I mean you didn't have to go in personally to give the sample how did you get the it's sample it's hard to give a sample in personally <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe mailed it I don't I know it's a, it's a rapid drug screen you, you pay you go down there that day and they do a nine panel screen and have the results in like 15 minutes I think is what it is how did you get somebody else's in there? A uh, separate little bottle in my pocket. <laughs> I did. I'm sorry. I've ne I, I apologize. You I've never sure? had you, one. You've obviously never done I've that. I've never had. No, sir. I never had. I... That's not an uncommon practice for folks that are trying to get a clean drug test. Well, how do you trust a clean drug test then? I know Vivian may, may have more intimate knowledge of that than, I mean, more knowledge of that than than, than we might have. Vivian, you got any input? The places I've been to recently have, the, they make you empty your pockets and they check yeah. your pockets. That, that's how I've always known them to be done by reputable companies is they, they check the person physically before they're allowed to give the the urine specimen to ensure that they don't have another sample to substitute. So I don't know about the East Green or that first company's policies that they are really that good. Is that the way the East Green did, Mr. Murray? Yeah, the, the places that I've been to recently have, they're like um, Concentra and so on. They check everything. They check your pockets and everything before you take the urine sample. The, the first time that it came back positive was from, I don't know what company it was from, but it was a lab that sent the results out. It wasn't a, a rapid screen. You tell me I can trust this one here that you gave me, this negative. Yes, ma'am. How long have you been working with Beacon? Um, 
probably about five months uh, I came on as in the, in the cabling department. Um, but I have, from being in the business for so long, I have a lot of knowledge in the industry, and I would like to further my career instead of being in the cabling department and you know being able to further my knowledge. Tell us about his work time with uh, with Beacon. Um, well, obviously, I wouldn't put myself in line if I didn't feel uh, strong about this. Um, and for what past, I know it's uh, I don't I just it's not my business what he's done in the past. I just want what he's d doing now. And he's a good employee. He's there. His knowledge is good. He's uh, there's a lot more than a lot of guys we got doing lead work. And uh, it's his career. It's a, it's an opportunity to to get back into doing alarms. Um, I know he's passionate about it, and I think that he's good at it, and I, I want him for that if we can have him for that. Mercy, and I realize that, and um, he's taken, I guess, three drug tests since he's been with Beacon now. It's, it's it we're a no drug, you know, workplace. <coughs> when, when he got hired on, he took a drug test. Uh, specific sites, when you go, contractors require you to do that. And then, of course, we did one the other day. Me, he had never failed a drug test. Um, sorry, to me, he had never failed a drug test and, and submitted to me um, until we found this out from the past. So, um, yeah, he made some mistakes, and it's it's uh, not good. But uh, I think he's a good employee. I think he's a good person, and, uh, and I want to. If if things go okay, we've I've already talked with the, the owners of the company of doing a monthly week maybe weekly, random, whatever, um, enforce that policy and make sure that it's a, uh, not that I don't trust him, but we want to keep ourselves straight too, so. Okay, Mr. Meyer, have you been charged since your last arrest? Uh, yeah. The uh, reason that he was before you before was the, uh, or his arrest record with in this, in the drug use, I'm quite frankly, is what? Uh, that was all prior to moving to Tennessee and trying to, start over and get my life together. Are you the gentleman from New Jersey that came before the board earlier this year? Yes, ma'am. Okay. When was the last time you used any drugs at all? Uh, prior to coming here in February of this year. The beginning of probably last summer prior to moving here. But yet you used someone else's sample because you weren't sure if any marijuana would show up in your system. Yeah, because of being around it with other people and knowing people that do it and putting myself in bad situations. Are you still hanging out with those people? <laughs> no, ma'am. Mr. Murray, I'm not terribly sympathetic. It It, it is my understanding that the... That, uh, uh, previous uh, appearance before the board, we gave you a second chance and, and you blew it. Um, I'm not terribly sympathetic to your situation at this point. Um, you know, it just doesn't seem that uh, uh, you you have been trying to live up to the second chance that you had at that point, and now you're asking us for basically a third chance. Okay. right out of my mouth. I mean, we obviously put some faith and trust in you in the, in the last time around to, to give you the chance to... It's not something we do a lot of. And, and to, to even go so far as to ask for the for the drug test regularly to, to kind of keep you on board. I, I don't... You know, we hear about how passionate you are and how you want to be in the industry and you want to further your career, but you're not doing those simple things that it takes to to get there uh, from from our standpoint, from what we're seeing. They, you may be seeing something totally different as the QA in short-term employment, but uh, what assurances do we have? What's going to happen different should we give that third chance? In a, in a year, I might add. Um, I mean, the, the difference would be, you know, 
subjected to the drug testing that was initially um, asked for me to do, you know, providing results and, um, I mean, the difference would be just doing the right thing and making the right decisions, not falling back on bad habits. Yeah, this this board is is charged with protecting the general public, but in in fact, what what we really would are end up doing is protecting the general public, Beacon Technologies as an employer, uh, and and hopefully you because if you're out on the job site and under the influence and uh, have some sort of an accident, it could hurt you. It could be very detrimental to Beacon. Uh, it could hurt the general public, so so it's important that the the role that we fulfill in trying to make sure that the people that are in the alarm industry are, are clean, sober, and and qualified employees to the best that we can do that. And frankly, your record just doesn't show that. I understand. Um, it, it just it just does not. On the other hand, I, I am fully sympathetic with with somebody that's trying to make an honest living and support a family and 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 conduct a normal lifestyle. I'm I'm fully sympathetic of that. So these two uh, understandings on my part are kind of in conflict. On one hand, I'm sympathetic. On the other hand, I'm not. Uh, I'm just trying to. Uh, figure out some real solution that would help all parties involved, would satisfy the statute and that uh, we're charged to operate under. Uh, would you, Ken would, and Keith, would y'all entertain that he continue on in a non-registered employee capacity with Beacon so he does remain employed for a period of six months and we require Beacon to test him at a legitimate screening site once a month for six months and then reconsider. I'd be agreeable to that. That way in six months at, if he's screened by Beacon, uh, and I want these to be surprise tests, I don't want them to be uh, any notice given to him. Uh, I can't, I don't remember the man. Is it Mr. Cunningham? I know you said Adam. That's correct. The, okay. I don't want these to be scheduled on the same day every month so that he has an opportunity to make arrangements, but to be almost a surprise testing for a period of six months, and then we'll bring him back before the board, and if he's tested clean, then we'll reconsider. That seems to be a reasonable solution to... Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, I mean, we are a drug-free uh, employment, so we are very hard on that, and, and we do that Anyway, but we absolutely, uh, we don't want people using, working for us, so. I know our company is the same way. We're, we're a drug-free workplace, and we do random testing. Yeah. But this would be more than random absolutely, testing. Yes. This would be a, a monthly test. Correct. And, and uh, come uh, back before the yeah. board six months from now. Well, and uh, if, I could, uh, if he's not a registered employee, or he's. He's not working he's not in the alarm either. She's working right. in a. So uh, he's not subject to whatever. Decision. We're, decision we're going you're going to make here so I, what are we saying it's up to beacon if they want to keep him in a non-registered employee position right for that length of time C correct and with with uh, what we're proposing would then be an opportunity for you to to become a registered employee in in the alarm industry yeah. it's like a pretty reasonable solution to me we, we cannot we cannot ask you to give a drug screening since you're not registered but what we're saying is if you were to come back here with six months clean drug test, we would reconsider. Okay. Yes. That way he continues to be employed with Beacon. Uh, you know, Adam says he's a really good, dedicated employee, very intelligent. So you don't really want to punish Beacon, but yet we have to ensure before we give him registered employee status that he's drug free for six months. I mean, it's a win-win for everybody as far as Beacon and with Mr. Murray, I think. I'd also suspect that if you turned up turned up with a positive drug test, that Beacon would, uh, um, with the drug drug-free uh, workplace, would uh, terminate immediately. I know that's what we do. That's correct. That's correct. All right, let me also explain I'm not going to be able to hold the application open for six months. 
the computer has been designed now to close uh, quicker. Like a reapplication. Uh, you would have to make okay. a new application. Just a midway time. point, just make a new application or so? At the end of that six months. Oh, oh, just wait, let it expire and then get to the end of six months. Well, it's, it's going to expire anyway. Wait, so, yeah, gotcha. At the end of six months, if you'll come back to the board uh, with, with a record of, of random drug tests on a monthly basis, that uh, you can show those, demonstrate those records, then, then we would reconsider a, a, an application at that point. Put that in the form of a motion. All right. Um, all right. I'll make a motion then that uh, if if Mr. Murray and and his qualified agent come back uh, six months from now, approximately six months from now, uh, with six monthly. Uh, clean drug test, then we would uh, consider an application uh, for a registered employee in the alarm industry at that point. Second. Asked a question, do you want me to bring it back to the board or do you want me to look at the look at them and see if they're clean and just approve? I think it could be handled administratively. Okay. We'll take a look at your drug exam when you make your application, you need to turn in all your drug tests. All right, so I can make that determination. Let me give you an opportunity to continue on in, in this, or, or to re-engage uh, in this industry, but you gotta stay clean to do it. Absolutely. Well, it's in your own best interest to do that anyway, so. Yes, sir. But you wanna stay working with Beacon, I understand. Stay I, I'm guessing Beacon want, wants you to stay with them or they wouldn't be here in the first place. Right, right. yeah, right. I, I need him, yeah. All right, so that gives you a path. We've got a motion then. Do you, you make a second? Giving. Ready to vote. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm not hearing Keith sometimes. That's what it is. Keith. We have a motion by Mr. Roberts and a second by Mr. Harvey that states uh, Mr. Murray will submit to drug screening for the next six months under Beacon's uh, purview. If his uh, screens are clear, he can make reapplication, and his registered employee status can be approved administratively. Is that correct? Yes. All right. All in favor, voice by say. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Sass, will you call the roll? Keith Harvey. Yes. Ken Roberts. Yes. Vivian Hickson. <coughs> uh, we motion carries. All right, Mr. Buck. Oh. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you for appearing before the board. And Mr. Murray, don't let us down this time, please. I won't. Thank you for another opportunity. Okay. Uh, Ms. Best, the next item on the agenda. Wait, well, just a, Madam Chair, can you hold just a moment, please? Uh, Mr. Murray, we'll go ahead and close out this application. so you understand what's going on. Uh, I was just going to explain to Vivian that, uh, that Cody is uh, going over some administrative matters with Mr. Murray. That's okay. I'm just sitting here waiting for my next instruction. I, I think I get instructions all the time. Some of them are not really uh, things that I could comply with. All right, I'm, I'm finished, uh, Madam Chair. I was just doing some uh, discussion there with how he's That's going. okay. How it's when, when you when y'all step out of the microphone, I don't hear anything. It just goes silent. Okay. We can move on down to my administrative matters if you would like. Sure. Uh, the next uh, item is the regulatory board's monthly report. Uh, yes, ma'am. We have the monthly report. All I have here actually is for October. There's not that much to report. We still are showing our two vacant positions. That was for Karen Jones and uh, Ken Roberts. Uh, Do we have any update on that at all? There has not been any update to my office. Uh, okay. The governor has not informed me yet. And, of course, they both are co continue to serve until we hear. And we serve. I'm not hearing anything. I said uh, they uh, continue to serve, and we certainly appreciate it. Okay, thank you. 
The next item is the budget review, which I do not have. I just got that yesterday afternoon. I do have some questions about that. So therefore, you're, I'm not going to put it on this agenda. I will present the, it would have been the October. So in February, we'll have several months of budgets for me to present to you. Uh, the next item would be the legislative update, and I don't have a legislative update either. I don't have an application for review, and I do not have a request for an extension, and we do not have any criminal records for review. Okay. So we move to the education report. I believe that this information was given out. We did uh, send some material to Karen Jones, but since she was not able to be present, I believe we sent that information to Ken Roberts. Posted it off on Ken Roberts, I would believe. <laughs> okay. I can, uh, I can go through the list. Uh, why don't I go through the list that I was sent first uh, with the recommendations? Uh, I received some 35 pages initially. Let me, let me just list the courses and the recommendation. Uh, the first course I have in my hand was Dinosaur Wisdom. Uh, for one hour of continuing education, I would recommend approval. Second one is Managing Cyber Security Bridging the Gap Between Leadership and Technology. One hour of continuing education and I would approve it <clears throat> for continuing education. Uh, incidentally, these uh, were requested for initial application, but they would be inappropriate for that. So they would just be for continuing education. The uh, next one would be Cyber Security Trends for the 2018 how business leaders need to take charge. One hour of continuing uh, one hour of continuing education. I would recommend it be approved for that. The next one is called Unmarketing. For one hour of continuing education, I would recommend it be approved. The uh, next one would be Five Productivity Hacks, which would be for one hour of continuing education, which I would recommend approval. There was a course called Hiring and Engaging Veterans, Why It Makes Business Sense and How to Do It, One Hour of Continuing Education. I would recommend approval for that. Uh, there's a course called The Sneaky Ways of Self-Sabotage. That sounded like a really interesting course. One Hour of Continuing Education, which I would recommend it be approved for that. There was a course called Servant Selling, for one hour of continuing education, which I would recommend. There was a course that, What Keeps You Up at Night 2017? That also sounded like an interesting course, but uh, we would, I would recommend it be approved for the one hour of continuing education. There was a course entitled, And Then Some, The Art of Exceeding Expectations which uh, would be for one hour of continuing education. I would recommend approval. And there was a course called The Data You Need to Effectively Sell Comprehensive Security, also for one hour of continuing education, which I would recommend it be approved. Um, those were the courses that I was sent initially. <clears throat> Subsequent to that, I received another series of courses. Um, I think these were the ones that were sent to Karen initially, and uh, there was a course called System Enhancement Module 201 for one hour of uh, continuing education. There was a course that is called Video as a Service 201 for one hour of continuing education, which I would recommend it be approved for that. There was a course called Interactive Services and Image Sensor 201, which I would also recommend for one hour of continuing education. There was a course entitled Installer Tools 201 for one hour of continuing education, which I would recommend approval. There was a course called Automation and Energy 201 uh, for one hour of continuing education, which I would recommend approval. 
and there was a course called Alarm.com Doorbell Camera 201 uh, for one hour of continuing education, which I would also recommend approval. Those are the courses that, that I reviewed, and uh, do we want to make that a, a motion at this point? Or there, you, you have some courses? Mm -hmm. Okay, why don't, why don't we go ahead, let me go ahead and deal with these, and I make a motion that these, all those courses I just read be approved for the one hour of continuing education. Second. Vivian, did you hear that? Vivian? Vivian? No votes. Okay. <coughs> Uh, apparently, we have lost Vivian Hickson. Uh, who's we, calling we, we can, we can still here. continue on once. Uh, once vote. Yeah, once you establish a quorum for a meeting, then it would continue unless there's an objection. I, 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 That's Robert's rules of order. Yes, sir. Which we adopted. Yes, sir. I mean, <laughs> our staff attorney is telling me no. We had this discussion in case Vivian did drop off. Mm -hmm. And I have been instructed that we would not be able right. to vote. And that, that's been confirmed uh, with the policy director. Let's see if we can get the Vivian back on the line. I imagine for any of their approved courses that they but have not, to test I'm back. There she is. Okay, you're back, Vivian? <laughs> yes, I got dropped. I'm back, though. Oh, uh, okay. Well, keep it. I mean, uh, Mr. Roberts, would you mind your motion again, please? I make, made a motion that we approve all of the courses I read for one hour of continuing education as requested. And I second it. Okay, thank you. We have a motion by Mr. Roberts and a second by Mr. Harvey to approve all the courses read into the record for CEU cor or for CEU uh, credit at one hour. Yes. All in okay, Ms. Beth, will you call the roll? It's Harvey? Yes. Ken Roberts? Yes. Vivian Hickson? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And um, I believe, Keith, you have some courses as well? No, I, I didn't cut down any trees like Ken did, but <laughs> I just, uh, <laughs> the ones you sent me was the ESA, <laughs> the ESA, and they were all for continuing education. I did read through every one of them individually and uh, thought they were all well sufficient for uh, one hour and two hours of continuing education. Do we need those read into the record? Yes, I, I, I believe so. Yes, ma'am. Hold just a moment. Now, these here okay. go right over to him, then the next mm -hmm. one. Like me, Keith, I can read them into the record unless you want to. I don't me. <laughs> okay, with the ESA, is troubleshooting service and maintenance online continuing education for one hour. These are all continuing education. ESA, how to prevent the best solutions for your client's needs in one hour. Adams Wright, R-I-T-E, storefront product applications, two hours for continuing education. Introduction to commercial sales, one hour. Alarm.com, now this is, uh, you have two copies. I have two copies. Selling integrated systems, one hour. Selling commercial video surveillance systems, one hour. Selling commercial intrusion systems, one hour. Selling commercial fire alarm systems, one hour. Selling commercial access control systems, one hour. Prospecting for potential, potential clients, one hour. They were all, they're also asking for 11 hours of credit for their leadership summit, which will be held on uh, February the 12th through the 15th, 2018. It would, it, how do you need to effectively sell comprehensive security and then some? Let 
the one that you already had, Ken, I apologize. We got approved twice, I suppose. <laughs> That's all we haven't approved that the second time yet. <laughs> oh, okay. And these were given the keys as well. All right, that's all that we had. Uh, yeah. We're going to approve those. I'd, yeah, I'd make a motion to approve the ESA courses for continuing education that's been read in the record. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Harvey and a second by Mr. Roberts to approve the ESA courses for continuing education at the rate of one in two hours as read into the record. Ms. Bass. Keith Harvey? Yes. Ken Roberts? Yes. Vivian Hickson? Yes. <coughs> Motion carries. Okay, and y'all cut out, do we need to also have a motion on the 11-hour leadership uh, conference request for February? Uh, no, no, ma'am, that was in uh, Mr. Roberts' course that, listing. That was just when they're going to offer these particular courses that I read into the record. Okay, I'm with you now. Do we have any more course reviews to uh, go over? No, but I do have something I need to bring to the board's attention. I would like to read this email that I have received from ESA. As a provider of approved quality education for fire, burglar, and CCT inf installation clarifications, classifications, the electric Electronic Security Association, known as ESA, would like to request information on what steps we need to take to have a new exam proctoring process approved by the Tennessee Alarm System Contractors Board. Currently, we use either ESA's National Training School, the initials are NTS, instructor, or a third-party testing center to proctor the end-of-course exams. This proctoring and test taking occurs with the proctor and test taker in the same room. However, we now have the ability to use web-based proctoring through a third-party provider. The ESA Education Committee thoroughly vetted the web-based proctoring process and feels very confident that it is a secure method of proctoring an ESA slash NTS course exam. We are happy to provide the Tennessee Alarm System Contractors Board more information on the web-based proctoring system so that they can be ad adequately review it. Please let me know if you need any additional information. And this is from Michelle, and I will spell the last name, Y-U-N-G-B-L-U-T, Vice President of Training and Certification with the Electronic S Security Association. Now, I know we have discussed before the proctoring in the web-based. Uh, as far as I can no, remember, far as I can remember uh, we had some problems with that, or you did. How about we have uh, Ms. Youngblood up here before the board in February to provide detailed um, information on how this works? instead of trying to vote on it today because i see in her email she said that um she would be present at a future meeting would that be agreeable uh mr roberts mr harvey hey, that would be agreeable with me all right so we'd like to extend her an invitation to the february 2018 meeting what do i need to tell her She's coming to speak on that. Just to explain the web base, or explain yeah, explain how they how they uh, would conduct the uh, coursework and how they would proctor the examination. <coughs> That's saying right. Yes. No. My biggest concern is uh, that the person taking the test is actually the person that's being tested. I, I think I think we would all have that have that concern. Yes, and I think we, we've, like, we, like I've said, we have addressed this before, like with colleges. A lot of every, the days is going to web-based testing. Uh, you can do it at home, you can do it in the classroom. Uh, this is how we do some of our testing, set it in our office. When we have to uh, do our exams or whatever. Take specific courses, we do it on our own computers. We're locked in, they know who we are, and we're sitting at our desk taking these. So. Um, 
we're going to have to consider. This is more and more moving further and further into the future. I think Vivian's suggestion that yes. we, we invite uh, the lady to come and explain the process and how it's done and, and how it's validated so that it, it's secure and uh, assuring that the person taking the exam is actually the one that is getting credit for the course. Okay, we'll put it down. I will extend her the invitation to come at the February meeting. I think it was a good suggestion, Vivian. We don't, need, we don't need a motion on that, Vivian. Okay, that works for me. Um, the next thing, let's see, let me pull the agenda back up. Did you have that under the course review? Do we have any unfinished business? I don't have any unfinished business. Do we have any new business? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm going to read this email as well. Uh, I'm not going to read it all. It just says, nice speaking to the gen I've been asked, what type of license and testing do I need to obtain to... What type of license and testing do I need to obtain to install residential alarm systems that would include keypad, door contacts, motion sensors, and glass breaks? smoke detectors, and heat detectors. We also install door locks, doorbell cameras, thermostats, and lamp modules that integrate with our alarm system so that these devices can be controlled over the customer's cell phone. I saw on your website you inc encourage further education and list alarm.com as a resource. We are alarm.com alarm certified and an authorized dealer in seven states. This is from Ryan Torrance, T-O-R-R-E-N-C-E, -E, with Safe and Sound. <clears throat> it sounds to me that he needs to be uh, go through the process and become an alarm systems contractor in the state of Tennessee, just like anybody else if he's uh, installing alarm systems. He's asking agree? his classification and what classification? It, it would be my opinion that if he were licensed as a burglar alarm installer, that that would be sufficient. Uh, now, that would be predicated on the understanding that what he is doing is installing a couple of heat detectors, a couple of smoke detectors as part of a burglar alarm system. And that also, that installing the doorbell cameras and and such would still fall closely enough under the burglar alarm uh, category to to be sufficient. I, I would not think that to install a doorbell alarm as part of a burglar alarm system that he would need, for instance, a closed circuit TV license, uh, just as he would not be required to ins have a fire alarm license just to install a couple of smoke detectors as part of a residential burglar alarm system. So in well, summation... A, oh, I'm sorry, it, it wouldn't be required, but we could encourage him to seek uh, the fire category. I agree with you on the doorbell alarm. That's, that's kind of minimal for CCTV, but if he's going to be installing the fire components, maybe encourage him to seek the fire classification as well. We could encourage him to do that, but, but the way, way we have looked at that in the past, um, and I believe the way our statute reads, that if that's as, as a portion of a smoke detector added as part of a burglar alarm system, would not require beyond the burglar alarm category. Now, if on the other hand, he were installing fire systems, uh, that that was what he was installing, then he would need the uh, fire alarm license. But if he was in... If he was installed as smoke detector as part of a residential burglar alarm system, then his burglar alarm classification would, would allow that. Okay, so what I'm going to respond back to this gentleman is, based on the information that he has provided in his email, he would need the burglar alarm classification. That's correct. That's what All right, thank you. Uh, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Okay. Keith, Ken, do y'all have anything? Let me ask a question. In, in going through the minutes from our previous meeting, it see, uh, there was something else that was going to be brought back before the board. I don't recall right offhand what it was. Uh, there was some previous business that I had expected to be brought back. 
presumably at this meeting. All right, just a moment. I, but I honestly don't recall what it was. Office, we didn't. It was wasn't stipulated to be brought back at this meeting, so it, it could be something that would be brought back at a future meeting. And All right, we'll go I, back and look at our minutes and we'll make sure. And see if there was something else that was supposed to be brought right. back to the board, but I, I really don't recall just yeah, what it was. I found it. It's on page 22 of the October minutes. I'm trying to go back and see what it pertains to. Um, maybe start on page 20. Give us just a minute, Vivi, and we're looking it up. Oh, that's okay. I, I just I just pulled the, open the minutes to see if I could find what Ken was talking about, and page 22 referenced what Ken's talking about. Okay, go back to page 12. I think that, that might be where it starts. This in regards, um, if I can ask to a complaint. Yes, ma'am, it is uh, case number four from the October legal report. Okay. Case number 2017-047211. Mm -hmm. It says this case arises out of an industry complaint alleging failure to register employees. I think that is where this actually starts i just pulled it up on page 22 and okay I um I, starts, I can kind so. of speak to that um okay at this time we're still waiting on the full investigative report to come back from the investigator i've spoken to him a couple of times but i wanted to wait to get the full file before i brought it back to the board okay so we we can expect it at a future meeting then yes i should be able to present that to the board in february Okay. It'll be fine with me. Okay, Mr. Roberts, anything else? No, I don't believe so. Okay, the meeting is adjourned. If we can turn the camera off.